Father, we just thank you and praise you for this opportunity tonight to open your word, Lord. It's, it's always exciting to open your word, Father. It's always exciting to hear what your Spirit has prepared to tell the church tonight, Father. And I just pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding, Lord, to teach it, to hear it, to receive it. And your word, this book, this book of Revelation tells us right at the start, Lord, that there's a blessing in it for those who teach it, for those who hear it, and for those who put it into practice. So, Father, I just pray that blessing for us tonight. So be with us in all that we do. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Tonight we're going to be in the back end of chapter Revelation chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 9. We looked last time at the situation in regards to the great multitude that was in white before the throne of the Lord and um, the seventh, the seals that were opened and the seventh seal at the start of chapter 8 when there was silence in heaven that holy hush that was in heaven for half an hour and then of course we look at it from the point of view that the seven seals that were opened on that title deed to the earth and just to remind you that we know it was a title deed because it was written in both sides and that would be self-evident to the people in the churches that John was writing this epistle to, this, this vision to. And remember that in some measure this was a, a real-time vision that John was writing about here. It was actual experiences. There were dialogues between him and angels and him and elders, etc. So it's not as if it was some sort of ethereal thing. I mean, John appears to have been literally transported into heaven and shown this as that which must come after. So this, this title deed of the earth that no man was capable of opening except the man Jesus Christ. And of course, because the title deed had been given up by a man, in some measure by Adam, by the first Adam, then it had to be redeemed by a, a relative of the first Adam. It had to be a man. So in some measure you find the Bible calling Jesus the second Adam the one who would come and, and redeem that which was lost so we find this situation here that when the seven uh, seals were opened the seventh seal heralds in the seven trumpets and then you get six of them and then the, the sixth the seventh trumpet heralds in the seven bowls uh, and there's a little parenthesis in between all of these things uh, we found between the seven seals and, the, and the, the seven trumpets that there was sort of chapter 7 there where the 144,000 and the, the great multitude in white were, were talked about. The, those, who would come out of Revel, those who would come out of the tribulation and be saved. We looked at that from the point of view of, of an analogy with the book of Joshua. And uh, if you want to get the the, the tape it will be there to see but I can't go into all tonight but to be said that you know when seven trumpets would be mentioned to these people that John was writing this this vision to they would immediately of course think of Jericho where the seven trumpets were sounded so there were seven priests with seven trumpets seven circuits of the walls of Jericho on the seventh day and the walls fell down uh, and we looked at all the sort of picture book analogies between the book of Joshua and uh, the, the start of chapter 8 there in, in Revelation and one of the other things that I kind of missed last week was that if you look at the book of Joshua it takes 7 years for Joshua to clear the land of the usurpers, the people who have no right to be there so we find Adonai Zedek, this so-called king of righteousness, he's hiding in a cave. And uh, there's an analogy, there's a crossover there between Joshua 11, when we get to Joshua 11 and the division of the land that's given to all the people. Uh, that ties in with the division of the land in Ezekiel chapter 47. But the difference is that Ezekiel chapter 47 is the division of the land in the millennial reign when Christ comes back and the land is redistributed uh, and, and the Jews are given their, their true place and all the tribes and divisions and clans of the Jews are given uh, their proper place within that. 
And I think we looked at it from the point of view that although the tribe of Dan had been literally a betrayer or a, a idolaters, when you look at Ezekiel 47, they're first in the queue in the land division. So God is gracious and to the nth degree in that sense of the word. Now at the end of the millennial reign, of course, we get to a stage where Satan is allowed freedom once more and many people ask me, well, why, why, why would they allow Satan to be loosed once more after the end of the millennial reign? Well, it would appear, and we'll get to it eventually at some point in time during this study, that there will be people who are born during the millennial reign. There will be children. And these people are to be given a chance to choose Christ or not to choose Christ. So Satan has to be released for a short time that this might be accomplished. And that ties up with the book of Joshua as well. Because where the choice is given at the end of the book of Revelation, then we find at the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua stands up and tells the people of Israel, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So they had the choice of even when they had entered the promised land, even when they had taken the land from the usurpers, they were given the opportunity to choose. You can either serve the Lord or you can serve the gods of the Canaanites, etc. And you can find that in Joshua 24 and 15. So we've got the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and of course we'll go into the seven bowls eventually, these bowls that are poured out. The things to watch for here is that the trumpets are almost what you might call the the one third judgments there seems to be one third things happening uh, during the judgments with the trumpets if you've read through the chapter at all and uh, when you get to the seven bowls they don't get a partial judgment they get a whole judgment the whole bowl so in other words we're kind of built built up to this the the seals that were broken when the seals were broken it was almost as if men were allowed to do what they wanted to do and they brought bad stuff upon themselves when the when the trumpets are sounded this really is in some measure God's judgment starting to come upon the earth so we looked last week and, and at the end we saw that you know, the prayers of the saints were offered up in a golden censer with much incense and then the angel took the censer uh, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it to the earth and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. That was at verse 5. And then at verse 6 we got the, then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. And the first angel at verse 7 sounded his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. This indeed sounds like, it could be a number of things, but it sounds like a nuclear exchange here that there is some sort of um, there's something happening that brings this great devastation upon the earth there came hail fire mixed with blood now you wonder where the hail comes from before we actually get to that in all the history of mankind no matter what they've developed as a weapon and no matter how much deterrence they've put into that weapon saying well uh, we need to have it so that if you've got it you won't use it because you know I mean this backwards and forwards thing but never in the history of man if you look back through all the weapons that were developed from bows and arrows through gunpowder through cordite through all the rest of it right up to atomic weapons never has there been any situation where man has not used the weapons that he has invented they've always been used They've never ever not been used. And we see that already of course in the fact that at the end of the Second World War uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima where the atom bomb was dropped upon them. And uh, so men, uh, if they get a hold of a weapon, eventually they'll use it. And I think this is what's happening here. I believe this is what's happening here. Now, when we were silly enough and a number of years ago 
maybe 50 years ago or 40 years ago we used to have above ground atomic tests we used to explode bombs in the surface of the earth to see what the reaction was of the earth and a lot of the times they took them out the Americans, the Russians they took them out into remote parts of the Pacific Ocean and, and, and set them off and one of them was on a, a, a little atoll called Bikini Atoll I don't know whether you've ever come across it in the history books but Bikini Atoll the, the they exploded a very large atomic device on Bikini Atoll, I think in the late 50s probably, or early 60s. Such was the strength and size of the explosion that the whole atoll just disappeared. And all of this stuff was thrown up into the air, thousands, hundreds of thousands of feet into the air. And of course behind it, because you had such a tremendous blast going up, nature abhors a vacuum. And all the air rushed in behind it. And all the water rushed in behind it, and of course it was sucked up by it, the same way as you get with a tornado. If you spin it fast enough, it will suck everything up that's in front of it. Well, in this same way, you get this tremendous push up from the bottom. So there was literally millions of tons of seawater were dragged up into this great mushroom cloud, hundreds of thousands of feet into the atmosphere. And of course, when it gets up there, as Jesus said, everything that goes up must come down. You know, and, uh, and he's coming down soon. Um, so you got all this water up there, and of course it passes through the various layers in the atmosphere, and then it freezes. And it comes down like huge hailstones. And that's what they found in Bikini Atoll. That it came down with such a force of hailstones that it was virtually on the verge of sinking ships. It certainly destroyed all their monitoring equipment that they had left in various islands around the, 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 the place. But there were these huge hailstones that came down because of the amount of water that had been sucked up. So this may indeed be exactly what John's talking about here. And if you add in all the other mix of it, of course, um, if you add in all the soil that would be in the water and all the bits and pieces out of the sea, the whole thing could look like blood as well. Like that dark brown colour as it comes down. And of course, an atomic explosion, what they call ground zero, is where all this debris would be would be taken up and blown up into the air. But there's a tremendous, first of all, there's a sonic wave goes out from it. Um, well, that's not strictly correct. There are two waves go out from it. There are a sonic wave and a heat wave goes out from it. One of them travels at the speed of sound, and the other one virtually travels at the speed of light. Now, the heat wave travels at the speed of light, and the sound wave travels at the speed of sound. Or... or just slightly above the speed of sound. So you've got this tremendous wind force travelling outwards at almost 700 miles per hour. And in front of it, you've got a, a thermal force that is something approaching 1,000 centigrade. So once this thermal force is pushed along, it burns everything in its path, and anything that's left, of course, when this sonic wave hits it, it just blows it to pieces. It just knocks it down. So everything is absolute destruction within, well, certainly with the nuclear weapons they've got today, I would suggest that if you dropped one on Stirling, just one on Stirling today in the middle of Scotland, you would eradicate the whole of Scotland. It wouldn't need any more than one. That's the power and the force that these weapons have today. You could literally eradicate the whole of Scotland. Now, it seems that this, it seems to be at this point in time that if it is a nuclear exchange that's happened here, then it's been limited. Because it says here that a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. So there have been a number of bombs dropped all over the place, but it's amounted to virtually a third of all the living things upon the earth that have been affected by it. Now you can imagine the situation with that. You've got this atomic explosions that have occurred and now we're in a situation where you can't grow anything in the ground. You have the same situation that you've got in the Chernobyl area today that, that uh, 
mean the people in Chernobyl or not in Chernobyl because they're not allowed to stay there but the people in the surrounding areas are running around with Geiger counters in the vegetable markets to see which has got the least amount of radioactivity in their carrots and in their onions and even to us today here in Scotland there are farms still in the southwest of Scotland who are not allowed to take the sheep off the ground they're not allowed to sell them for food I don't know whether you knew that or not but there are still farms here today in Scotland where you can't take the lambs and the sheep off the ground because the ground is so badly contaminated I don't know whether you remember from 1986 but when Chernobyl went up there was a great radioactive cloud which actually passed over the top of us and the unfortunate thing is that the day that it passed over us was heavy rain like today and all the radioactivity was brought down by it and hence and I make no bones about it I mean we're not talking about tribulation time now we're talking about pre-tribulation time here we're talking about now I believe that that's why there are so many people now with cancer in Scotland because of Chernobyl they reckon that the radioactivity at the level it was at would take 20 years to have effect and yet we see now many many people from the mid 90s onwards I mean I mean Maybe it's just because we're getting old that we hear about people with cancer, but there seem to be more and more people with cancer than we've ever known before. So you can imagine the situation when, when the time comes that this happens, that we would have a situation where a third of the earth was burnt to a crisp, and one third of the trees were gone and there was no green grass. I mean, that, it, it doesn't, even, doesn't even bear thought and yet we can be thankful that we are not going to be here but there are going to be many people that we do know who are going to be here and we spoke about that last week this great multitude in white who would be saved through the tribulation so I say again don't stop witnessing to your friends because it might be tonight that the church is raptured we might go tonight You might have no more chance to speak to your friends about Jesus. But when they have to go through the tribulation, there will be a time comes when they will think about what you have told them and think. Gordon was right, Fiona was right, John was right. I need to put my trust in the Lord. It will cost them dearly. But they will be saved. But as we said last week, they won't be part of the church per se, they will be as the book of Joshua talks about the Gibeonites the servants of the Lord who will serve, stand before the Lord all day, whereas we will be seated with the Lord, the body of Christ anyway, so here we have a third of this all mixed up, a nuclear exchange some sort of um, huge uh, cataclysmic event here so we've got the, the land destroyed and then of course we come to the second angel in verse 8 and he sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea a third of the sea turned into blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed now again it's this third thing and, and people say to me but this is all just symbolic you know the fact that it's a third of this it's all just a, 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 a metaphor a euphemism for, for something else or whatever and you know when you look at these plagues and they are plagues in some measure you can compare them with the, the plagues of Egypt were the plagues of Egypt uh, fragments of people's imagination I think not Egypt was utterly and absolutely devastated by the plagues that God brought upon them by the judgments and the judgments were not in some measure brought upon the people of Egypt but were brought upon the gods of Egypt if you look at all the plagues that affected Egypt it was all to do with their idolatrous worship and the people who supported the idolatrous worship they worshipped frogs therefore they got a plague of frogs they worshipped flies therefore they got a plague of flies the priests wanted to be so holy that they shaved every piece of hair off their body so that it would be ultra clean so God sent them a plague of lice to eat on their bodies and you know, and then at the end of the day they worshipped Ra, the great sun god from which the word Pharaoh or Pharaoh comes from and of course here, Pharaoh is, is a loose translation of the word son of the sun if you want to call it that and what did he do? he darkened the sun 
So God in these things proved himself to be who he was. And in the same measure, he will prove himself to be who he is in this. Now, something like a mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. Now, this indeed sounds like some sort of asteroid or or a huge meteorite that strikes the earth. Um, Where the first one we could put down to men's inhumanity to man in a nuclear exchange, this second one appears to have been a deliberate hand of God act, if you want to call it that. No man could predict the fact that an asteroid was going to hit. In fact, they tell me, as I was reading the other day, that there is an asteroid headed our way and they can't make up their mind whether it's going to hit us or it's not going to hit us. But it's going to turn up in about, and I I don't want to worry, but it's going to turn up in the next 20 years. Um, By about 2030, I think they reckon, it'll pass us. But it'll pass by within 18,000 miles of the Earth. Now you think that's a long way, but it's not really a long way. The moon is 250,000 miles away. And the moon influences all the water tides, the sea tides on this earth, depending on its, the phase of the moon on different parts of the earth. Now, that can make the seas rise and swell by, in some places around there, 25 feet. Think of some huge object that passes within 18,000 miles of the earth. What it would do to the gravitational effect uh, on the water and maybe even on the land you could indeed have such a gravitational pull that pieces of the earth are pulled out and you get a land tide Um, so this asteroid here that hits now the fact that it's only again going to affect a third of things would indicate that it's not too big so I looked at some sums for this And it would have to be something under 5,000 kilograms in weight, something just under 5 tons, not much more than that. Otherwise it would literally knock the earth off its axis and throw it into some sort of kilter. Now, 5 tons is not a lot, but that's the size of the rock that you would be talking about to cause this sort of devastation. Now, it would be almost impossible to detect it. It's literally a piece of dust flying through space. Five tons, the size of a bus, maybe. I mean, to pick that up in some sort of radars or or all the sort of equipment that they've got, it would be totally blind to it. They would never be able to see it. The first thing they would know about it was when it actually hit. Uh, So you're talking about something that's just under five tons. A third of the sea turned to blood now. It would appear then that this thing crashes into the sea. A good chance it will crash into the sea because 75% of the world virtually is is covered in water. Now, a third of the sea turned to blood. There's a possibility, of course, that when one of these sort of asteroids hits, it would turn the top 75 metres of the ocean into a desert that literally anything in there would die, that the algae would die, and that you could, you could, I'm not saying that you would, you need to check this for yourself, but you could get these, these, the small animals and, and, and the, the microscopic animals in the top 75 metres of the sea, if they died, the chances are that they would literally bleed and that the, the oceans would turn to blood you would see great plumes of red in the oceans because of these microorganisms that were totally destroyed or could be fried. Um, The heat that's off this thing would be quite incredible. But tremendous tidal waves. Um, I mean, it just doesn't bear thinking about it. That's a great thing. That's only maybe five tons in weight. A third of the sea has to be affected now Three quarters of the Earth is covered in water. The Atlantic Ocean, that we know as the Atlantic, is about a third of all the water, the seawater that is in the world. So you could literally say that the whole Atlantic Ocean would be devastated. I'm not saying it would be in that 
proportions but that's the sort of volume of water you're talking about being affected it could be in patches all over the world but the chances are if this asteroid hit it would only hit in one place so there would be a huge devastation on one third of the water in the sea the interesting thing about the Atlantic is that it would be the flight path for many of the missiles that had already kind of passed backwards and forwards by the, by the first angel if this thing did hit the Atlantic Ocean there's a couple of things that you have to bear in mind here that it says that a third of the shipping would be affected now there's currently as far as the best in the figures I can get between 120 and 140,000 ships at sea at any one time there are more ships than that but there are between 120 and 140,000 ships at sea at any one time and 40,000 of them are normally in the Atlantic Ocean which is about one third so you have a, 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 a situation here or a scenario, scenario here that if something the size of the Atlantic was struck with this asteroid you would have 40,000 ships that would be sunk and the whole body of water would be devastated I mean that is quite incredible to, to just think about that as I say some people say that these things are fragments of our imagination but why should we not take them literally why should we try and, and, and marginalise them by saying that they're figures of speech or metaphors or whatever many people have tried to disprove the, the miracles in the Bible over many years there's a guy called Dr. Bernard Ram who famously wrote about the, the crossing of the Red Sea and the parting of the Red Sea in the Old Testament now the parting of the Red Sea is one of the most talked about events in the whole Bible if you look at it there are hundreds of mentions of the Red Sea being parted in, in the Bible so this Dr. Ram decided and you've probably heard this before that, that it was not the Red Sea that the Israelites crossed but a marshy ground to the north of the Red Sea called the Reed Sea and it was a mistranslation and in this Reed Sea whenever the wind blew in certain directions you got a, a, it could blow the water because the water was only less than sort of three feet deep it would blow the water in one direction and, and hence literally make some of the ground a dry ground and that was why the Israelites managed to cross this so readily but of course biblical scholars will say to you then that makes an even bigger miracle than it was in the first place because the whole of Pharaoh's army drowned in less than two feet of water <laughs> um, so it can if you're going to accept the fact that there was a crossing of the Red Sea then Dr. Bernard Ram has tripped himself up in some measure in that that uh, you know when the wind stopped blowing the water came back and all these guys just died in two feet of water um, it's a bit hard to swallow that I think in some measure so there we are here we are in this earth we've gone to be in heaven we're sitting there at the moment and, and we're literally watching what's happening here on the earth and what we've got to remember is that in some measure what's happening in this earth and I keep emphasising the fact that it will, it will be happening to people that you know and that you have known all your life and that you have tried to witness to and have refused your witness and as I said to you I think last week or the week before or the, the last study that Charles Spurgeon said that during the tribulation time it would be the greatest revival ever in the history of mankind there would be more people turned to Christ in the tribulation than there ever would be in the 2000 years since he, since he uh, first appeared on the earth now that's a speculative statement but it's a possible statement when you consider these things that are happening here on the earth at this point in time nuclear exchanges pieces of, of asteroids crashing into the earth I mean it just sounds absolutely horrific and a third angel I think we're at the third angel are we yes I think so 
A third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water and the name of the star was Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Without too much comment on that, at some measure, the word Wormwood translated in the Russian is Chernobyl. That, that's, that's the Russian translation for it now. I'm not putting any emphasis on that fact. Uh, whether this would be... Uh, we're obviously not in the, tri- the, the, the tribu- uh, tribulation time at the present time. Whether the Chernobyl incident 20 years ago was something to, as a wake-up call to people. Um, it certainly did in 1986 cause a lot of people to look at their Bibles and to check their their uh, dictionaries etc to make sure that you know the Russian equivalent of Wormwood was, uh, was Chernobyl but this great star now again we've got a situation here where it would appear that possibly the earth at this point in time was being showered by asteroids and small meteorites that there had been some sort of shower or, or there had been a big one that had broken up uh, I don't know uh, but it sounds like the same thing that's happened to the sea only this time it's coming crashing down in the land now I don't know whether you remember a number of years ago in Siberia there was a not a big meteorite but something that was only maybe the size of half a car and it destroyed thousands upon thousands of acres the trees were all just flattened and you know the momentum the, the inertia that these things carry they're travelling through the earth's atmosphere at you know 30,000 miles an hour I mean you get hit with half a ton of something like that and it's going to give you a problem uh, there's only one winner um, so if you think about the, the, the meteorites and asteroids that have hit us in the past uh, there certainly could be a real problem here with this one so this, this, this great thing like a great blazing star you can just imagine the trail coming in through the, the atmosphere it fell from the sky and a third of the rivers and in the springs and the name of the star is Wormwood a third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that became bitter now there are probably in Britain 20 to 30 major rivers if it were happening in Britain you would be talking about 10 of them being poisoned there are probably in the United States 100 major rivers and if it were happening in the United States you'd be talking about 30 of the major rivers in the United States the Missouri, the Mississippi the, the, you know, the whole lot of them the Potomac a third of them would be poisoned now, I was looking into this poisonous thing because it intrigued me that, uh, that this great cataclysmic event could poison the water. And one of the things that happens when a piece of rock comes travelling through our atmosphere at such speed, there's a tremendous heat developed. You can see that for yourself with the space shuttle and with all the space landing and things I mean when you hit the atmosphere at 25 or 30,000 miles an hour if, it's, if you're not quite at the right angle uh, in your space shuttle you're toast you know that, that's it and unfortunately we've seen that in the past that just a few of these tiles missing on the underside of the shuttle and, and the whole thing is up in flames now this piece of rock is it travels through the atmosphere will develop massive temperatures around it this great ball of fire literally it will be 1000 degrees centigrade plus and as it does that it splits up the oxygen and the nitrogen that are in the atmosphere you've got them at the moment they are separate in the atmosphere but they're so well interlinked or, or, or mixed that it's almost impossible to separate them I mean it's like taking uh, it's like taking diluting juice and pouring it in water how do you get it back out you don't, it becomes impossible uh, it's just the molecules of them are so well mixed that it's impossible to separate them but if you take some really hot stuff so if you take if you heat them up to a tremendous degree then they both react differently to the heat 
and you actually get a combination of them uh, which is nitrous oxide and then the nitrous oxide in itself with the water vapour that's in the atmosphere turns to nitric acid and nitric acid is an extremely let me tell you it's lethal uh, pro- byproduct of this process and it would be this product that would be leaching into the waters the other thing that comes out of this is that you know they talk about this water being like wormwood now wormwood is a it's a herb actually uh, uh, and it's it's chief characteristic is a product called absinthe I don't know whether you've ever come across absinthe before but absinthe is an extremely hallucinogenic drug um, which taken in small doses will make you feel really euphoric and, and you know like Peace Brother and all the rest of it and all that sort of stuff the old hippie stuff but if taken in any great quantity it will kill you and will kill you quite you will die rather badly it is an extremely dangerous material now this absinthe can actually be formed out of the atmosphere of the earth if you heat it hard enough you get this nitric acid forming with this absinthe so you could have a situation I'm not saying you would have but you could have a situation here where the waters were being polluted by this nitric acid and this absinthe and as people drank them they became literally euphoric oh lovely water you know (laughs) where do you get your water but of course as they go on and drink it it becomes toxic totally toxic to them uh, and they die and we have a situation here where a third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter one of the things that came into my mind when I was doing this was uh, was Exodus 15 when Moses led the children of Israel and they came to Marah the place that had been three or four days without water now if you can imagine a few million people it needed a lot of water for them so when they came across the, the waters at Mara they all kind of ran into Mara and said oh yeah beauty and they started drinking this stuff but it was absolutely toxic it was not to the point where it would kill them but certainly um, they, they might spend a long time in the toilet afterwards um, it was really that type of a cleansing product and I always said you know that God didn't want to just take the people out of Egypt he wanted to take Egypt out of the people you know it was uh, one of these kind of things um, but when the water was bitter the people complained against Moses and said oh, why have you brought us here you know we're looking for water we're dying of thirst and yet you bring us to bitter water and God said to Moses there's a tree there take the tree and throw the wood into the water and it will make the water sweet and I tried to put all this together and maybe I'm over spiritualizing this but the wood that I thought of that makes sweet water is the wood of Calvary that you know when we are in the bitter waters it's the cross at Calvary that brings sweetness back into our life and of course if you look at Psalm 22 in verse 5 and 6 what was it Jesus said when he hung for the cross I am a worm and not a man and there's a great study in that as well because the worms that he talks about are you know all to do with this though your sins were a scarlet but I can't go into that at the moment um, so if you think about it you know here we have a situation in our lives where before we became to salvation our lives were filled with bitter water but when we took the worm that was on the wood and took him into our lives he brought a sweetness to us that was a that was more than beyond the compensation that we deserved so this wormwood is going to bring bitterness into the lives of the people whom it affects because they've rejected the cross of Jesus Christ they wouldn't believe that Christ could bring the sweetness into their lives so they rejected that and it's cost them dearly the death from poisoning through nitric acid and absinthe are, are really quite bad deaths you die a rather agonizing death so that's our third angel there and then the fourth angel here we are at verse 12 
The fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark, a third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. So we've got a situation here now. We could look at this for the physical point of view and say, well, was a th- did a third of the sun disappear and a third of the moon disappear? And I don't think that's what the Lord would tell us out of this. It's the, the light giving effect and, and the heat giving effect has disappeared. Such as the, if you want to call it a nuclear winter, we're now in a situation, if you can imagine what's happened with the first angel, with the, with the nuclear exchanges, if you happen with the second and the third angel with these great asteroids hitting the earth and throwing millions of tons, probably trillions of tons of debris into the air, there's going to be a great cloud over the whole earth. Now, I don't know whether... I think it was Mount St. Helens, when Mount the top blew off of Mount St. Helens. In towns that were 30, 40, 50 miles away, they were dark for days, and, and feet deep in, in ash and in dirt, and they never saw the sun for days and probably weeks in end because of this great cloud that covered them. People couldn't breathe, they were having all sorts of uh, respiratory problems and all the rest of it. So, so that, to me, is where we are at this point in time. That this, the whole earth is literally consumed by this cloud of debris that's high in the atmosphere and it's blocking out the sun. And it says here that there will be a 33% reduction in the amount of light. A third will disappear. A third of them will turn dark and a third of the day was without light and a third of the night. Now the moon is obviously dependent upon the sun for its light. We know that the moon is a reflection of the sun. So if the sun loses its, uh, its reflective power, or its, you know, then the moon loses it also. Scientists have predicted that if we did get into some sort of giant asteroid scenario or a nuclear exchange that was, well, a nuclear holocaust where lots of weapons were let off and exploded, then we would enter this period that they would call the nuclear winter where there would be that much dirt and dust in the atmosphere that the sun couldn't shine properly and that's exactly what the book of Revelation is telling us here that a third of it would be lost now if you lost a third of the sun's heat you would be in a situation that, that places like let's say the west coast of America, California which in midsummer is probably in the high 40 centigrade. The highest it would get to is 15. 15 centigrade. That's as warm as it would get in California in the summer. That's according to the scientists. That's what they tell. Uh, if, we, if we hit one of these nuclear winters where the, the light and, and heat reduction for the sun was brought down by, well, I think they talked about a quarter, but this is a third, so it might even be worse than that. There would be no possibility of growing crops. There would be no possibility of growing food. There just would not be enough light and not enough heat to give you any sort of form of photosynthesis. And people like us living in places like we're in, if you think it's dark now, wait till you see the cloud because it will be like this. It will be like this literally all day and all night. It might just get a little greyer, but that's about it. And the temperature would be such that it would be almost unlivable. By this stage, of course, the chances are of us having piped electricity and gas and all the rest of the things in your house are pretty remote. And uh, the opportunities to stay warm and have warm food are vastly diminished. Thank God that we're not going to be here. And that's what we need to thank tonight, that his salvation has brought us to a place where we don't have to suffer this terrible devastation that's to come upon the earth. And then in verse 13 it says, And as I watched, this is John watching the whole thing happening, I heard an eagle that was flying in mid-air call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. So here's this now. Some of your translations might call it an angel that was flying across. But in the Greek, it's, the word is actually eagle. 
Um, now, whether it's we did that. Um, whether it's a an eagle or an angel, a uh, it's going to cry out in a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded. In other words, if you think it's bad at the moment, wait till the next three are blown. And that's something that, you know, woe, 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 that's the sort of next three trumpets that are coming. And in some measure I was thinking about that because I believe that that's why when the cherubim and the elders and the angels are all gathered around the throne of God and they shout holy, holy, holy is the Lord because he's a God of three parts Father, Son and Holy Spirit so it's holy, holy, holy it's not just a holy God it's a holy, holy, holy God so that's something to uh, keep in mind and I think when we get to this fifth angel that this eagle or angel who was flying in midair and calling out in a loud voice? It, it almost seems unreal that this voice might be heard across the whole earth, and it's a voice of woe to the people. And it talks about the inhabitants of the earth. Now, remember, the inhabitants of the earth are not you and I. We are inhabitants of heaven. We don't belong to the earth. Even now, we are not inhabitants of the earth. We are sojourners, we are pilgrims here. We have changed. There are two kingdoms that we can be part of. You can be part of Satan's kingdom or part of God's kingdom. Uh, But there's no middle ground. People say, oh, so-and-so's sitting in the fence. So-and-so's not sitting in the fence. They're in Satan's kingdom. You can't be halfway Jesus said that himself. He says, there's only two options. You can be a son of Satan or a son of God. Make your choice. And that's what he told the Pharisees. And that's something that we have to make the choice as well. We've made our choices tonight. But there are many people whom we know who are still inhabitants of the earth, who put their trust in the earth. And most of the people that are out there are of that ilk. That they think by saving the rainforests and patting the whales and hugging the trees that they're going to make some sort of eternal difference because their whole their whole life is based upon spaceship earth that this is it this is all we have there's no more if spaceship earth goes belly up then the whole thing goes belly up and we know that that's not the truth but they don't And although we should be good stewards, yes, we should be. We should be good stewards of everything that God gives us. But remember this, that this earth will last as long as God wants it to last. And it will not last a minute less or a minute more. It will last for that length of time that God has designed it for and for no longer. And although they talk about many of the animal species who are becoming extinct and all the rest of it, I watched a program on television the other night about the Amazonian rainforest and they're reckoning there that there are areas still where they've got these little tree frogs and some of them are so poisonous you'll die if you touch them. I mean it's not even a matter of getting spat on or whatever you just need to touch them and it's zippo. Um, But there are so many of them and so many different kinds that they haven't even managed to name they reckon they've managed to name a third of them and there are thousands of them so we're this far down the line and think we're clever and we're not clever at all and many of these people the intellectuals today will will try and dissuade you of this so we're not the inhabitants of the earth this angel or this eagle that flies around and cries woe across the earth and it cries woe because the nature of the judgments that are coming upon the earth changes and these first four trumpet blasts here will have actually physical devastation upon the earth now we're going to go into a period of supernatural devastation upon the earth when real demonic activity starts to take hold before Christ comes to judge all of that as well he's about to loose all the demonic forces the, the, the most cruel and horrible demons that you could ever think of are about to be loosed upon this planet 
And the fifth angel at the start of chapter 9 sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. And the star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And when he opened the abyss or the abyso or whatever the bottomless pit or whatever your Bible translates it smoke rose from it like smoke from a gigantic furnace the sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss and out of the smoke locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree but only those people who did not have the seal of God in their foreheads now we know from previous chapters the only people that had the seal of God in their foreheads at this point in time were those who had turned to the Lord and indeed they may not be sealed but the 144,000 are the only ones that we know that are sealed so these guys these locusts now you see but this is another star that's fallen yes but it's a different word that they use for the star this star that fell from the sky was Satan this is the great Satan the great dragon now there were two events in Satan's life one of them happened way back in the garden of Eden and the other one happens way forward in Revelation one of them happened at the start of creation and one of them happens at the end of creation because this creation is being destroyed and, and a new creation is going to come our way with a new heaven and a new earth when we see in Revelation 21 and 22 so Satan has, a, has two major events one is that he rebelled in heaven Isaiah 14 I think Ezekiel remember when Ezekiel 48 maybe I'll, I'll get that scripture for you. I don't seem to have it written down here. But certainly Isaiah 14 talks about the one who was the morning star. Who was the, the shining one. And that's what Lucifer means. The word Lucifer means shining one. He was one of the main cherubim who served before the throne of the Lord. And worshipped him day and night. And it says in Isaiah that he was the great shining one until iniquity was found in his heart and that he was to be he wanted to be greater than God he said I can do this better than God and we realise from Revelation 12 that not only was he very proud in himself that he was a very good manipulator because we find in Revelation 12 that we're told that he took a third of the angels with him in this rebellion against God that he wanted to be better than God and thus for his rebellion he wasn't cast out of heaven at that point in time but he was cast to the earth heaven would cease to be his home the earth would be his home he was still allowed access to heaven because we find in Job 1 that he stood before the Lord and, and asked about his servant Job so Satan still had access and that's one of the reasons why God will create a new heaven and a new earth because the heaven and the earth have both been contaminated by Satan so God will recreate the heaven and the earth to be rid of the stain of Satan forever so this great star that fell to the earth that was the first part of Satan's problem the end part here is and we'll see it in Revelation chapter 12 in fact this is what's happening here uh, it's described better in Revelation chapter 12 but what's happening here is this is him being thrown out of heaven no longer will he be allowed to come into heaven he's, he's cast to earth permanently so I saw a star that had fallen that had fallen from the sky to the earth now, if you're interested in what Jesus had to say about these things, you have to look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. I want to just go there very quickly. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. You don't need to go. I'll, I'll go there for you. But uh, you might want to make a note of this. 
because it's something that we all we all fall into the hole eventually with and it's Luke's Gospel chapter 10 at verses 18 and 19 in fact we'll go back to verse 17 this is when Jesus sent out the, the 72 disciples in twos to go around the villages and the towns of Galilee and to proclaim the gospel and in verse 17 of, of Luke's gospel chapter 10 it says the 72 returned with joy and said Lord even the demons submit to us in your name and what was Jesus reply I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy nothing will harm you however do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you but that rejoice that your names are written in heaven so no matter what your ministry is don't rejoice in some wonderful ministry just rejoice in the fact that Christ has saved you because that your ministry should never be your passion Christ should always be your passion and that's in some measure what Satan failed to grasp his ministry was his passion he thought I can be better than God I can do the job better move over Heavenly Father I'm taking your place and of course for that he was cast to the earth he was still allowed access to heaven it would appear but he was cast to earth for that but at this point in time God is about to deal with him so he's, he's excluded from heaven completely he's cast to the earth he'll stay there but the star we see in the middle of the verse there the start of chapter 9 the star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss now the abuso or the bottomless pit was the place where where the angels who had sinned were kept for eternal damnation for judgment at the great and coming day of the Lord now there are a number of scriptures here that you might want to look at 1 Peter 3 18 2 Peter 2 verse 4 and Jude verse 6 and uh, we'll maybe start there Jude's just just before Revelation I call it Revelation chapter a half it's uh, So Jude in verse 6 it says and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home these he has kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. And then if we go to 2 Peter 2 4 it says there for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned but sent them to hell or the abuso putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah a preacher of righteousness and you can read that on for yourself and of course then we come to 1 Peter 3 and 18 for Christ died for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God he was put to death in the body but made alive by the spirit through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built now in Ephesians 4 as well it tells us that before Christ ascended he descended and he descended into hell and he descended into a place called paradise or Abraham's bosom and he took captives in train now there's a lot of discussion about this but here's my take on this that before Christ died on the cross and the blood was shed there were Old Testament saints like Abraham who believed God and it was credited to them as righteousness now when these saints died they have to go somewhere but they can't there's no admittance to heaven because you have to be washed in the blood so the Jews and the Bible teaches us that there's a place called paradise or Abraham's bosom 
And we see it quite clearly in Luke 16, I think, with the rich man and Lazarus. And people say but that that's just an allusion to something. But it's one of the only stories where, the, if it were a parable in itself, why would Jesus use a, a man's actual name? It's the only story where he actually calls a man by name, the rich man and Lazarus. And of course we find out that the rich man dies and Lazarus dies. And, and although the rich man had no time for Lazarus in, in, the, in this life, when the rich man died, he went to Gehenna, he went to hell. And the, the Lazarus, when he died, he went to Abraham's bosom. But there was a great void between them that no man could cross, that no one could cross. And the rich man cried out and said, Lazarus, could you just dip your fingers in the water and come and touch my lips? I'm so parched with the, with the, the tremendous bitter waters, if you want to call it that here. And Abraham called to him and said, he can't come. No one can cross this gap. No one at all. He said, well, send him back. Send him back to tell my brothers and my family that, you know, if they want to make peace with God, they have to make it in their own life because here I am destined to, to suffer in hell. And of course, Jesus said to them, even if someone were to come back from the dead and tell them, they still wouldn't believe. And of course, he was talking about his own resurrection at the time. So we have all these people who are waiting for Christ to redeem them. We also have a situation where we have these, these angels who are being held in, in the abyss. And they're held in chains. They are part of the group of fallen angels that fell with Satan. Part of the third of all the angels. Now he's very, very, uh, very, very articulate Satan. I mean, if you're sitting there looking at God and seeing the Almighty and all His glory and all His reverence, and this guy comes up and says, "There's better than that," you know. I mean, how do you convince somebody? But he managed it. So don't listen. Don't have any conversations with Satan. Run away. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. So we got this situation where. These angels who were kept for damnation. We've got demons that are running around at the moment. And we've got some others who are held in, in chains waiting for God's judgment in the abyss. So who's who? Now these are the, the ones that are held in the abyss are the really bad guys. These are the real bad guys. Now... We read in those scriptures there in First and Second Peter and in Jude. There was a lot of talk about the flood, and we know that before the flood, that it talks about the sons of God, who are all angels, by the way. I mean that, but some of them left their estate, left their position, as it says in Jude, and they had sexual relations with the daughters of men, and there was a race of people created that were called the Nephilim. Now why would Satan go to the bother of that? Because he wanted to completely destroy the line of Adam. That was why. And by the time the flood came, there were only eight people. There was only one family that was untainted by this sin. The daughters of men had given themselves over to these guys in such volumes that I believe that there was no one else on the earth who could be saved apart from Noah and his family who were the only righteous sons of Adam that were left and when the flood came of course it destroyed all of them and the Nephilim were the word can mean fallen one or it can also mean giant and they were giants and you had people like Goliath who had six fingers and six toes. They were freaks. And they were freaks because they were of, of an unholy union. And it, it is these demons who were committed to the abyss that God put them in eternal chains waiting for judgment. And what happens here? In the start of chapter 9, the star 
Satan was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Now, who had the key? God had the key. Jesus had the key. Satan can only do what he's allowed to do. He can't do any more. He has to have permission. Now, none of the demons want to go to the abyss. And you can tell that by the story of the gathering demoniac when Jesus spoke to them and he said oh we know who you are you're Jesus don't send us to the abyss and he said go into these pigs and of course we know that the pigs went crazy ran off the cliff and if you go into Israel we'll show you the cliff that they ran off it um, and all drowned demons are these kind of people although angels in themselves seem to be able to manifest themselves as, as human beings in the Bible Demons need a host. And so these guys are about to be released from the abyss. Now they've been released deliberately. Jesus is allowing Satan to release them because God wants to bring a judgment upon the whole earth using them. That those Christ-hating people upon the earth who rejected his message will have to suffer rather badly for their rejection. And so will Satan and all his demons. So the fifth angel sounded. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened. Here we'll get the same situation again. Now don't ask me where the abyss is. I don't know. But it appears to be somewhere in the earth. And out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth. And were given power like scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth, which scorpions, which locusts normally would. Which makes me think that in some measure, they're not really scorpions, but likened to scorpions. If you go into the book of Joel, Joel talks about the Assyrians who came down and captured the Israelites in the first captivity. He likens them to locusts. The locusts, these... These Assyrians who came down and captured the people. And of course he talks about the fact that, that, you know, the Lord will give you back the days that the locusts have eaten. Now, I believe that these locusts are demonic creatures. Now, you'll find out later as we go into this, as we go into this, that they have long hair. They're very seductive. They've got the faces of men and the teethy lions. And they're ready to rip you apart at the first opportunity. The locusts are really, in some measure, they're either some sort of weird creature, like an ethylene, or they're people who have been demonized. Earth dwellers who have given themselves over to Satan in such a fashion that these demons have occupied their body and become... Um, supernatural beings if you want to call it that now I know that that sounds a bit you think oh Jim what are you going on about here we're way off the pace here but this is what's going to happen when we're not here the whole earth is going to be turned into a, a wasteland the people are going to die in euphoria if they drink this water that's poisoned they'll think they're doing well and then suddenly they'll just die in torture and agony and then of course the judgments that come here these supernatural judgments that these locusts and it tells us actually that when these locusts get a hold of you it may well be that you'll feel so bad that these people will feel so bad that they're demonized and they'll want to kill themselves but they can't they can't even commit suicide because of the demonic force that's in them it won't allow them to kill their body because the demons need the body just the same as when they come out of the gathering demoniac they had to get into the pigs otherwise they would have to be subjected to the abyss and kept there so they need a host so these locusts may be these 
these demons who will demonize the people who are left on the earth or some of the people and they will have such control that put these people through such agonies that the people will want to die but the demons won't allow them to kill themselves because they need the host body I don't know where that sounds but the whole aspect of you know what these demons are up to and how they operate you'll have to come back in November to find out (laughs) because that's as far as we're going tonight so there we have the first five of the trumpets we've just got into the sort of the supernatural side of these trumpet blasts when God takes a hand and allows Satan to open up the abyss that has been been closed since the creation since the flood the the abyss has been shut up and these demons have been shut in there and all of a sudden they're going to be released and the only people who are not going to be touched by these things are those with the seal of God in their forehead and really that's really the 144,000 that we spoke about before everybody else is fair game even those who might at some point in time accept Jesus Christ as the Lord may indeed be subject to this sort of demonic torture so let's thank God that we're not going to be here during all this and we've done all that if you need them from the previous studies then please go ahead and get a hold of the tapes but let's just pray to finish Father we just thank you and praise you that Lord you just inspire our hearts Lord it's, it's devastating to think that some of our friends and family might have to go through all this Lord and only because they refuse to accept you but Lord I give you thanks for all who are here tonight who are prepared and have accepted you as Lord and Saviour and if there are any here tonight who have not accepted you Lord I pray that you'll speak to their hearts now Lord before it's too late for this might be the last day the trumpet call might sound and we might be gone Lord that the dead in Christ would rise first and we who are left alive would be her part so raptured taken up to you Lord to meet in the clouds and in an instant Lord be transformed into your very likeness so Lord we thank you for that tonight we thank you for your word Lord and I pray that it will inspire our hearts to to speak more openly and more clearly to people that time is short Lord that we can't afford to be complacent we can't afford to be like some of the churches that you wrote to in, in, in chapters 2 and 3 who were complacent and, and thought they had everything sorted out Lord and they were poor, blind and naked Lord help us not to be like that help us to be a mission church a church with a mission Lord to see souls saved so Father we thank you for your word to us tonight and we pray that you'll just inspire us with it in Jesus name, Amen